thank you for joining me today for the Myopia podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Dwight Ackerman, and we're going to be talking about the business models of myopia management. As many of you know, Dr. Dwight Ackerman serves as the chief medical editor for review of myopia management, which is the world's most widely subscribed myopia journey journal. He's an internationally recognized senior healthcare leader with extensive experience in myopia management, peer education, communication, medical marketing, innovation, financial man management, and merger and acquisition business development and licensing. Dr. Ackerman was the vice president and global head of professional affairs and business development for Alcon before he retired in 2019 from that role. He's published widely and is a frequently invited peer educator on myopia management, cornea, contact lens, and business management topics. I'm excited to have Dr. Ackerman as part of the Myopia Podcast. Symmetric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. We're joined once again by the infamous Dr. Dwight Ackerman, uh, editor, head cheese at the Review of Myopia Management. How are you today, my man? I'm doing very well, Dave. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're excited uh, about this topic. This is uh, one that everybody kind of wants to talk about. And, you know, some people may not know the incredible business sense that you have. You have your MBA and you've been mm -hmm. uh, operating major organizations far larger than my practice with mm -hmm. your time uh, in, uh, in with Novartis and Alcon and SIBA. So you've, uh, you uh, have had some interesting conversations that have happened within Review of Myopia Management, and I wanted to pick your brain a little bit about the business models within myopia management. Mm -hmm. um, walk us through a little bit about some of the, the different business models that you've heard of. I know what I've used and a couple of my colleagues, but you've got mm -hmm. a pulse on a lot more. What are some of the ways that people are doing myopia management today and, and charging for it, so to speak, the business models? Mm -hmm. Well, indeed, in review of myopia management, we uh, publish clinical articles, but we also publish uh, a lot of practice management articles. And so this topic of implementation, mm -hmm. um, we've, we've written about this uh, on a number of occasions, and we've featured a number of practices that have uh, decided to take the plunge and, and to implement a myopia management uh, subspecialty within their primary care practice. Mm -hmm. So, so let me uh, provide some, some background. Um, as I have polled clinicians, uh, because review of myopia management does polls from time to time, and in just personal discussions with a lot of very successful practitioners around the United States, Probably the, 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 the biggest roadblock is how do I incorporate myopia management into a busy primary care practice? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I talk to a lot of practitioners who are, who are seeing two or three comprehensive exams per hour, plus, you know, emergencies, plus medical checks, and their day is busy. And so now, you know, when you talk about myopia management, they say, how in the world am I going to implement a myopia management strategy within my, my busy practice? And so I, and I acknowledge that indeed, myopia management takes a little bit more time. So if you normally schedule 20 minutes for a comprehensive exam, right. 20 minute, 20 minute visit, Right, you're going to do a perhaps a comprehensive exam on uh, a, a, a child, but um, you know you're going to have to reappoint that child for a full discussion about myopia management and do additional testing that'll be required. Right. So, so first, the, the first step is, I think, is determine how how involved do you want to be in myopia. Right. Do do you want to implement 
or not? Do you want to take the plunge and, and incorporate myopia management into your primary care practice? Now, there are some that have taken a concierge model. And um, I would say Treehouse Eyes has done that, you know, with their right. uh, some of their locations. You know, they have a very high-end uh, concierge model, which is very successful. Sure. But it's, it's certainly not for everyone. It's certainly right. not for everyone. You know, there's a lot of clinicians that say, I do want to practice myopia management, but, you know, I have other specialties. I also want to, such as dry eye or glaucoma that I also want to emphasize. So, you know, there, there's various levels of commitment to myopia management. I would say many practices, many practitioners I speak with are 50, 60 year old practitioners. And I always laugh and point out to them that typically their, their patient base is about the same age as they are. Yeah. And that's true, isn't it? That's true. Yes, it so I say, I say, look, if you really want to implement, you probably should hire a recent graduate yeah. that has an interest in pediatrics and perhaps even some pediatric training. Maybe, maybe they've done a residency in, in pediatrics. So I said, I tell them that, you know, if they really want to implement a and they don't want to do it themselves, they should look to hire a recent graduate who has an interest in children and in myopia management. So mm -hmm. that's, that's point number one. Yeah, you know, and, and I'll just tag on to that. When you've got a busy schedule with tens and tons of patients, and, you know, the reason why you're having to go to two to three appointments an hour and three to four an hour is because your reimbursements are going down and you're having to see more patients to, you know, be able to make more money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you really have two ways of going about this. Uh, and if you're wanting to do something different, one, is to hire an additional doctor to come in and bring something else to the office, be able to see some of those patients, freeing you up to be able to do those things. Uh, and that allows your practice to grow bigger with more patients. And then secondly, and there's a book called Small Giants. I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's a book about companies that have purposely stayed small, but doing it very well. And that would maybe mm -hmm. be one of those models where maybe you look at the insurance company that's reimbursing you the least, and then, you know, graciously share with your patients that you're happy to give them, uh, you know, a private pay discount and you cut that insurance, reducing the number of patients yes. that you have in your office, allowing you to have time to bring in a subspecialty yes. that then allows you to generate more revenue and help a larger uh, a larger patient base volume of not not number wise, but being able to extend the services that you have, really two totally different agree. ways to go about that, right? Um, and totally neither agree. of them is wrong. Uh, both of them are you know certainly suitable and have been done successfully by all of our colleagues. I would say that totally agree with you, Dave. But that makes a lot of practitioners nervous. Well, <laughs> that it makes them not very easy. Ner very nervous to cut manage vision care plans and to reduce the number of patients they're seeing. They, mm -hmm. they, they are very nervous about doing that, but you're mm -hmm. right. Some do and, and have been very successful at doing it. Mm -hmm. But again, going back to, you know, preparing the office to provide myopia management, right. you know, there is not only scheduling questions, you know, how, how do we schedule children um, who are uh, myopia management candidates? You know, after that initial comprehensive examination, you know, what, what does the next visit look like and how much time should be allotted? And then how, once the child begins an intervention, what's the follow-up schedule, you know, during mm -hmm. the first year and, and year two and beyond? So these, these scheduling questions uh, have to be thought through and, and, you know, committed to prior to beginning myopia management. And then there's staff training and then there's staff training, right? Staff don't know anything about, they're like parents. They've never heard of myopia management, right? Most staff think myopia management is prescribing single vision glasses or uh, single vision contact lenses because that's what most practices traditionally deliver. So you've got to train your staff. You've got to role play with them. You've got, got to make sure that they're fully educated about the, the long-term eye health issues of, of myopia, 
why we have to avoid high myopia and you know what the benefits are to the child of, of perhaps ending up as a two diopter or three diopter myo versus a seven or eight diopter myo. So yeah. training, training your staff is really critical so that they have the vision, you know, to be your partner. Because in most practices, guess what? The patients spend more time with staff than yes. they do with the optometrist. Yeah. yeah. And so they, they've got to be very well educated. So you have to make that commitment, that time commitment to educating your staff. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, third is the equipment. You know, many, right. if you're, if you're going to get involved in myopia management, uh, I think most practices today have auto refractors, but, you know, you may also need a topographer if you're going to be fitting orthokeratology. If you don't have a topographer now, that is a potential expense. And, and then an optical biometer. Um, as you and I have discussed in the past, Dave, you know, um, myopia is an axial length disease. It is. And, ultimately have to measure axial length because you've got to avoid an axial length of 26 millimeters or greater. You know, all of the peer reviewed publications point to that number that if, if a child has an axial length greater than 26 millimeters, the chances are that they are going to have later in life, a retinal detachment. They're going to have myopic macular degeneration. They're going to end up with posterior subcapsular cataracts, and they could end up with open angle glaucoma. So there's a lot of comorbidities associated with that, that uh, higher axial length. And the only yes. way you can measure that is with an optical biometer. Fortunately, all the major manufacturers are now coming out with uh, modestly priced uh, biometers that uh, are much more affordable and oftentimes have software that can help you manage that, that child, you know, keep records of, of their axial length and often plot that against uh, graphs that have been generated in large, in large studies. So yeah. they're becoming a lot more affordable uh, yeah. versus, versus the optical biometers that ophthalmologists oftentimes use uh, for cataract surgery. You know, those oftentimes are 50 to $75,000 that's not what we're talking about here. Right. We're talking about, about optical biometers from all the major manufacturers that are much, much more affordable. So I, you know, I believe that that is the future, that optometry yeah. will be acquiring those instruments to help in the management of, of the child. Yeah. And, you know, I always like having that conversation with practitioners. You know, if you, if you are listening and you uh, have an interest in having a conversation about you know, the equipment that you're needing as you're developing and building your practice, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, um, feel free to reach out to me, uh, Dave at optometricinsights.com. And we can have some of those discussions about the technologies to incorporate, you know, and mm -hmm. as Dwight pointed out, there's going to be instruments coming along that uh, are going to be are going to be a great addition to your practice because your auto refractor just died and now it's time to get a new auto refractor and I always say we don't need more more boxes we need more technology within each box so Correct. you know we should have topographers along with this and that and the other thing and yeah. auto refractors along with this that and the other thing ultimately the uh, the ideal box is capable of being produced today, which is an OCT, which has your autorefractory keratometer, your axial length measurement, all those things in one box. But I don't think that we're going to be able to get that one into our office anytime soon. So, Dwight, now how are we going to pay for this? Uh, yeah, that's a great you know? question. So there's two schools of thought there, Dave. As, as Again, I have spoken to literally hundreds of practitioners around the United States um, about their uh, philosophy. Um, essentially, there's uh, two schools of thought. One is charge a global fee. Um, so year one global fee covers um, all professional visits, uh, comprehensive eye examination, myopia management examination, four or five follow-up visits during the year, any emergency visits during the year. All the professional fees are covered in that global fee, and their uh, intervention is covered in that 
in that global fee, whether it's orthokeratology lenses or myopia control soft contact lenses or, um, you know, topical low dose atropine. And, and the nuance there is that, of course, that the, at the moment, because there's nothing FDA approved, the nuance there is that oftentimes in this global fee, it's slightly less for those children who are on the topical low dose atropine because the parents are going to be buying that from the compounding pharmacy. But mm -hmm. the contact lenses, ortho K or the soft lenses, would be uh, distributed and provided by the eye care professional. So, yeah. so that's global fee for the first year. And if, again, um, you know, one intervention isn't working and you need to switch to another intervention, all of that's covered in that global fee. Now, what about year two and three and four? Because myopia management is, is a long-term proposition. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're beginning to provide myopia management services to a six, seven, eight-year-old child, you know, chances are they're going to be monitored and treated for eight or 10 years. Right. So in terms of this global fee structure, uh, year two and beyond is generally about two thirds of what the first year fee, global fee is. So that, that seems to be the number that I have uh, ascertain from, again, literally speaking with hundreds of practitioners on this yeah. topic. And so why is it slightly less? Well, you've already, you know, conducted, you've already conducted the comprehensive assessment, you created a treatment plan, and you're generally only seeing the child two times a year, yeah. um, you know, moving forward. And so, you've already entered them into all the equipment in the office, which generally takes most of the time, right? <laughs> correct. Correct. Exactly. So a lot, <clears throat> there's a lot of time and a lot of explanation, a lot of discussion, a lot of education that's provided during that first year. So again, year two and beyond, uh, it is a lower global fee. And mm -hmm. uh, again, it's a slightly lower fee for topical low dose atropine because of the acquisition cost. You know, in terms of uh, parents always ask, well, is this covered by my managed vision care plan or major medical plan? And the answer is that I, sometimes the comprehensive e examination is covered by their major medical plan, or excuse me, their uh, managed vision care plan. And so <clears throat> they could apply for reimbursement for the comprehensive examination. But the rest of the uh, myopia management fee is not generally covered by managed vision care or major medical. However, however, some you know, flexible spending accounts or health savings accounts do cover part of it. So yeah. oftentimes parents will submit their out-of-pocket expenses in myopia management to their health savings account or flexible spending account and they oftentimes do get some reimbursement. Yeah. So, so uh, other ways besides this global is uh, have you have you heard other people are they piecemealing it together? Or, they are. Uh, yeah. So that's that's the other major camp is is the a la carte. Mm -hmm. So a la carte. So they're going to charge for their comprehensive eye examination. They're going to charge a separate fee for their uh, myopia management assessment and treatment, creating a treatment plan and educating the child and the parents. And then they're going to charge for their follow-up visits throughout the year. So yeah. there's, there's kind of three professional fees involved. And then, of course, the material fee right. for the contact lenses or the okay lenses or the um, you know, soft lenses. Yeah. And so, so there's a lot of practitioners that prefer that method. Um, I don't know why. Because uh, I believe that many parents feel like they're getting nickel and dime, and they're not getting, you know, other than some of these fees are reimbursed through the H HSA yeah. or FSA. Um, yeah, you know, they're they're paying out of pocket. So, right. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's important to educate parents that myopia management, like orthodontia, is going to be primarily out of pocket. 
Right. And, you and know, that's, and I that's think exactly, that, that's yeah. exactly Dave, how orthodontists charge, you know, sure. um, they build those global fees. Yeah. And I think that's really a, a good way to go. That's, that's my preferred method. That's how we've been doing it good. for 15 years in, in my practice. And, uh, and, and I'm going to make an argument for it here. So the, the way you generally come up with what this global fee is going to be for your office is you set a number randomly um, and talk to a couple of your friends and see if there's you know some consensus in the area. And most everybody has a general idea. And if you're off a little low or you're off a little bit high and you can get patients to move forward, then do it. Take the first five patients that you have find out the number of visits that you mm -hmm. actually saw them over the mm -hmm. course of a three or a six month period. You may see one or two patients after the six month period. We always do a six month check on our patients, but generally they don't come in again between the six month and the year uh, visit unless there's a need, but that's only about 5% of the patients that actually come mm -hmm. back. Take the number of visits that you saw on average for each one of those patients and then figure out what that dollar amount is per visit. And so what we generally would do is we would find out our revenue per encounter in our office. Mm -hmm. How many encounters do we normally see? Divide the revenue by, and then we come up with our chair cost, right? So now yes. you've seen the patient three, four, five times take that times that dollar amount because you're seeing this myopia management patient in place of something else. So that goes into yes. the dollar amount, find out your cost of goods, find out what your normal markup on your cost of goods is. And then there's a little bit of a uh, an added factor because this is a, just a little bit more complicated. And that comes into a number, which is probably pretty close to what you came up with when you guessed. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the way you set those numbers. And then in the years yes. to come, you're generally going to see the patient one or two or three times less per year, depending on how complicated right. the patient is, and you modify your fees from there. The beauty about doing the global fee is that when the patients need to come in, they come in, right? When you have a patient who is, you know, on the a la carte, as you described, uh, Dwight, is those patients hesitate to come in. And sure. they may not be getting the myopia management effect that we really want them to have. And we're losing in, in that encounter. So really, I think the best care that we can provide is the one where we're doing things on averages, right? I may see yeah. you two times, but I may have had to see somebody else four times. And on average, I bill everybody for three visits. So, Which again, is exactly how the orthodontists do it. Right. You know, they charge a global fee. And some are more complicated, some are less complicated. Some children they have to see more often, some children they see less often. But it's it, it's a global fee, and you know parents have have learned to accept that. I mean, yeah. most most parents, you know, accept that global fee from the orthodontist, and they just bill it in, or they just build it into their uh, home budget. Well, similarly. Hopefully, moving forward, as parents become more educated about myopia management, they'll mm -hmm. build this in to their home budget. Because again, this is primarily going to be out of pocket, and which again is a great thing for optometry. Yeah, you know, you and I yeah. have talked about how optometry is being strangled by managed vision care plans. You know, this is a great way to break the shackles and to introduce a subspecialty into your practice that is not going to be affected by managed vision care. Yeah. You know, and for some people, their budget, it's really difficult for them to come up with that large global fee all at once. So, you know, right off the bat, if you don't already do this, you may be wanting to uh, start planning for a subscription type of service. And we'll talk exactly. about that more in some future podcasts. But you know, there are services that uh, act kind of like a medical credit card where there's zero yes. interest for the patient uh, and you can get them signed up right off the bat. There's really not much skin in the game for you as far as what you're going to lose. And then there are also subscription services that you can provide, uh, you know, vision plans for your patients for eye exam plus glasses and plus contact lenses, and they pay the subscription over the course of the year and doing that with your myopia management or your vision therapy clinic. And we'll have some of those discussions on in the future here as part of the myopia podcast. 
Um, have you guys started talking about that at all with review? And do you have any uh, articles? We have uh, already on that. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we have. We have talked about uh, yeah some of these subscription services that um, do help uh, families that just can't write the check for you know mm -hmm. for a fairly large amount of money, and um, and so these subscription services really help them say yes. It really helps mom say yes. Yeah. You no, know, because you know, she's she may have three or four children, all mm. of them are myopic, right? And you know, she's thinking now, how in the world am I going to pay for, you know, several of my children to be treated for, you know, progressive myopia. Right. So I, I'm right. a big fan of I'm a big fan of these subscription services. Yeah. So I want to bring up one other aspect because we're uh, we're kind of talking about things that are expensive. And quite frankly, there are some myopic families that they can't afford any of this stuff. And I uh, want to bring up something that we're doing in our office and get your take on it, Dwight. Uh, you've heard something similar is, um, you know, we've over the years developed quite a few patients who have had myopia management. And, you know, you can go to those patients and those families and just say, hey, we're setting up a scholarship fund for other families. We'd love to see if you would be interested in contributing something to that. Um, we also contribute a portion of our profits in our practice for patients who, you know, don't, uh, aren't able to, uh, to pay. There's some insurances that we do not take that would be really re re low reimbursement. So rather than taking those insurance companies, we set aside some of the money that we have. And then there's a group of patients when they can't afford mm -hmm. it, they apply for a scholarship. And uh, you know, the scholarship committee made up of a couple of people is uh, able to look at it and you know mm -hmm. try to help those patients. That's we wonderful. usually don't give it away for free. You know, They yeah. do have to pay yeah. a portion of it so that yes. they find the value. Um, yes. But those are really nice things to be able to do when you do offer a high value, high cost program in your office yes. is find a way to give back for those patients who are not legitimately able to afford it. I think it's a the great profits that idea. you have. That's a great idea, Dave. Congratulations for implementing that program. I was not aware that that you've done that. And it's it's a great way to help some families that just can't afford it. Yeah. You know, again, as I said, oftentimes they'll there'll be two or three or four children and all of them are myopic. And, and so the yeah. parent is saying, you know, what am I going to possibly do here? You know, how am I going to choose one child over another child? Right. So, right. so that's a, that's a great way to help some of Well, family. yeah, I'll admit to you, we were doing it in our vision therapy practice for years. And uh, I, I don't know why I was so dense to not move it over into our myopia management uh, world, but it is uh, certainly something worth considering. And if anybody has any questions about a program like that, feel free to reach out and uh, and let me know. Any closing words here on business yeah. models and charging uh, patients for what we're doing here, Dwight? Well, I think um, my closing comment, Dave, would be that, you know, it's important to think through, you know, these financial aspects prior to implementation. It is. If you just, if you just jump in and you're unprepared, uh, your office is unprepared, your staff is unprepared, you know, chances are you're going to lose money. Mm. You know, you're, you're not going to make the revenue that you were making with your busy primary care practice that was humming along, you know, seeing three or four patients an hour. So it's important to really think all these aspects through that we've talked about here over the last few minutes and to, to set a fee schedule that makes sense for you, that your staff can explain because the staff is, are the people that are ultimately going to explain the fee schedule to, to the parents. Um, yeah. But, you know, now's the, now's the time to get involved. You know, we're, it is. we're right at the beginning stages of, of a, you know, whirlwind of activity in myopia management. You know, as you and I have talked about, Dave, right now there's only a few products that are FDA approved for myopia management or myopia control. But there are literally, you know, five or 10 products that are on the horizon to be FDA yeah. approved here within the next few years. And with all of the good work that GMAC 
and other organizations are doing to educate consumers and other stakeholders about myopia management. You know, parents are going to start coming in and asking about myopia management. You know, this, this business of having moms say, I've never heard of myopia management. What are you talking about? I, I think you're going to see a lot less of that moving forward. So now's the time to get prepared and get proactive. Absolutely. Well, Dwight, it's always a pleasure to uh, get to chat with you, whether on the Myopia podcast or getting to talk to you about review of myopia management or, you know, at, uh, one of these breakout sessions that we have. It's been always great to hear your insight and your perspective. Thank you for what you're doing to support us that are in the, in the clinic, uh, helping our patients. Uh, we sure appreciate all your perspectives and all of your work to help move our industry along. Thank you, the listener, for joining us for this episode. We're so grateful that, uh, that you've uh, come along for the ride with us. Uh, look forward to future episodes. Make sure to like and subscribe. Uh, leave comments if you uh, have anything that you think uh, we need to be talking about the Myopia podcast. And uh, make sure to leave a five-star review so other people know uh, what you think of our program. Have a great one and uh, join us next time for the Myopia podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.